So we're beginning our recording now. Okay, Doc, Matthias. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, this is the first substantial talk after the introduction of PubCon 2021. Today is 8th of November. My name is Matthias Delvig. I'm working as a software engineering, as software engineer at Red Hat. And I'm going to give a small overview over the tasking system that has been developed in the past year. And I think there's something we learned and there were some challenges we overcame and probably some more to come. I'm trying to structure this as a small presentation and hopefully we'll, we will have time for a little bit of discussion afterwards. So next slide, please. Um, yes, we needed a new tasking system because there were problems. So let's talk about the problems. Let's talk about solutions taken and then look at what we gained in a conclusion. Next slide, please. Again. Um, Pulp always had a tasking system, and of course, Pulp 3 always had a tasking system. And this tasking system was kind of inherited from Pulp 2. It was using the same um, architecture. It used the same backbone worker threads, which were uh, salary based at that time. But it introduced a new concept, and that was that the tasks were able to lock on uh, multiple resources at the same time. And well, it all started with the hanging tasks. And hanging task is something that I heard a lot in the context of Pulp 2. And at that point, Pulp 3 was already in the making, and I had a look. After trying to understand what was going on, wrong with Pulp 2, I had a look into Pulp 3, and I realized, oh, this looks roughly the same. So I had a lot of discussions with, I think, Brian at that point. And I was told, oh, it's OK, it's OK. Pulp 3 is going to switch to RQ, and this will solve the problems. And it looked like, actually, I must say, it looked like the problems were gone, but at some point, the hanging tasks came back. And I think this was due to a small bug in RQ, which was admittedly fixed fast. But the deeper analysis was that uh, the architecture had tasks represented in two databases at the same time. There was the pulp database, being it Mongo or Postgres, doesn't really matter here. And the other database was um, whatever the task queue used to track its tasks. And in Redis queue, and this was obviously a Redis database. I think this is called the out-of-box pattern. And it's really, in my opinion, the heart of the problem here. Uh, next slide, please. So at that point, the legacy tasking system turned into a simple task queue that had a complicated task distribution mechanism in, uh, in form of the so-called resource manager. And on top of that, there were a multitude of consistency and cleanup hacks. So it's really, um, yeah, it, it got patched and patched and patched, and the problems didn't go away. Wait. It still had a lot of, it still created a lot of churn. Um, next slide, please. Apart from the consistency problems that uh, arose from the fact that the tasks were represented in two databases at the same time, we also identified that the resource manager is a rather slow thing. And at some point, we saw that it can 
that it was able to dispatch about two tasks a second, which means if you have fast running tasks and you can add more workers, you just don't get any more uh, speed up because two tasks per second was the limit at the bottleneck being the resource manager. So at that point, we decided that we want to rebuild the whole thing in a completely different way. Next slide, please. Why did it take so long? Um, well, first of all, the problems were rather hard to reproduce on a development system, which is usually a small installation tuned for fast developing, and the problems really came on the larger installations on scale. Um, so at some point, we instantiated a tasking system task force. And we try to manage all the problems. But um, at, at that point, we still needed to support the old legacy tasking system. And we kind of still do. And this takes resources, obviously. Also, introducing such a big change in a core component of your project needs a lot of planning and caretaking. So next slide, please. So at that point, we decided to rewrite the thing. And actually, uh, even before we de decided this, we had a discussion on last year's PulpCon, which is like 13 months ago now. And we talked about a solution or let's say the, uh, one of the problems here is that uh, everything uh, is around resource locking. And so the idea could be if you don't need to lock on resources, all the problems go away. And so we had a discussion about so-called lockless pulp. And the idea is if everything is immutable, then there is no need for locks because everyone can use everything and no one will change it while you use it. But the problem is this would have been a very, very big change in all parts of Pulp and the core idea of what Pulp handles. And so this was too scary. And we kind of wanted to go a yeah, less intrusive way at that point. On the next slide, please. So for the solution we came up with, uh, let's revisit the resource constraints here. Um, tasks in Pulp act on resources. And usually, they should act on resources exclusively, because if one task changes a resource, then another task cannot rely on the state of the resource. And therefore, it should wait. And also, we say for each single resource, the task that claimed the resource and is the oldest one to do so should be the first to act on the resource. So this kind of means the tasks are serialized by every single resource they use. And every other tasks need to wait. And if you look at this from another perspective, then this means once a task is the oldest on all of his resources, this will stay that way until the task is finished and no longer needs the resources, which then gives room for other tasks to be the new oldest on that resources. And that means every single algorithm you run to identify the set of tasks you can work on must come to the same conclusion at the same time. And at that point, we realized, OK, we don't need a resource manager anymore, because everyone can do the same calculation and come to the same result. And then you just grab a task that is ready to be work on, worked on. Um, next slide, please. So at that point, the distributed pulp worker enters the stage. 
And the top features here are, there is no top-down distribution of tasks, but the workers use kind of a crowd algorithm to race for the next available task they want to work on. And we started using Postgres advisory logs uh, to serialize the workers on the tasks so that no two workers can grab the same task at the same time. And this is one big upshot or, or two. Uh, this makes the Postgres server the only communication point for all the workers and other processes that dispatch tasks. And at the same time, the cleanup of locks we get for free because once the Postgres server realizes that a database connection is dead, it just cleans up for us. So this kind of summarizes the ideas behind the new tasking system. Uh, next slide, please. So um, one of the highlights of this tasking system is it was tested in production. I'm not quite sure what that means. By a community member, maybe on this call. But I really say this is rather a sign of frustration than a good thing to do. I mean, frustration with the legacy tasking system at that point, which kind of circles back to the why did it take so long slide. Um, but at some point in time, we introduced the tasking system with the Pi version of Pulp, I just realized. So 3.14. And we introduced it to live side by side with the old one because we wanted to be very, very careful to not break existing installations here. Uh, just before releasing 3.14, we decided, OK, this is the upstream project. We need to move fast. We need to get features in, uh, in running state. So we switched it to be the default, uh, despite the previous plan to introduce a non-default some at some point, switch it on by default, and then remove the old system. So we just switched it on. And as far as I remember, we got good feedback from this move. And it came just in time for a new feature that is non-exclusive locks on resources. So now tasks can even opt to share resources for read-only access. And this had, would have been impossible with the old design. And then as a last step, and we are past that, uh, the legacy tasking system was removed in you know too much, uh, version 3.16 of Pulp, which is still the current one. So next slide, please. I said we learned something on the way. And I think what we learned is it's never too late to redesign a core component of this, of such a software project. Another learn is that architectures matches a lot. Uh, simple with less components is usually better. And what I personally learned is that keeping multiple databases consistent with the same data is almost impossible. And one very nice thing we learned is that including downstream projects early in the discussion leads to better adoption of a feature. So while still planning what we want to do, we already uh, made calls with downstream projects. And I think that helped those downstream projects to adopt the new tasking system with less uh, fear, to say. And at that point, I want to open up the rest of the session for discussion. So next slide, please. Thank you to this point. And one slide back, please. So when you say consistency across databases, are you talking about Postgres and Redis being yes, consistent? Exactly. Or 
for that purpose, uh, Mongo and uh, Celery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the problem is that tasks were represented in both databases. And whenever something went wrong, and it was never clear what can all, what all can go wrong, it ended up having unfinished tasks in one database while the cleanup job in the other database is gone, or something like that. Yeah. So Matthias, uh, you mentioned that the this the all the the performance issues were only really visible on large scale uh, like deployments. Um, well, the performance issues I could see on a development box that that it's impossible to dispatch more than two tasks a second. But yeah. the the um, consistency lockups or the, or the lockups and the consistency problems usually came on bigger installations. I see. And was that a function of the pop running across multiple nodes or the function of pop running multiple locks or both? I mean, running multiple tasks at once. Uh, I have no idea. Yeah. It was usually you need to run a lot of tasks and maybe restart a worker. And at some point, you end up with the gem system. Right. It's right. So I'm trying. I'm trying to think as the person who maintains the development environment. If there's any way I could help catch these errors in the future, you know. Um, yes, on the way we identified a lot of problems, and I think we, well, added patches, not to say fixed them, in the old tasking system. So, yeah, we hope it's it's better now than before, but it's still hard to say if if you really closed all the lo um, all the holes. Yeah, gotcha. Thank you. Um, Douglas? I was just going to answer Mike's question, uh, at least from a personal perspective. Um, our pulp instance, we've got multiple pulp instances, but from a pulp perspective, they're, in, they're completely independent. Um, we got all the way through local testing um, where we're just proving the code out without any issues at all. And it wasn't until we hit production where we were uh, generating releases and the release would create circa 2000 tasks and we would see maybe um, two or three stuck tasks then and it was on a single node um, no restarts involved um, yeah yeah that's wow that's at least 2000 tasks wouldn't do a, a release job or release your release workflow, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting. <laughs> I, I'm trying to think. I have to keep this in mind consciously as a as a real you know real world use case. Uh, thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. I mean, it's not, it's it's humbling, but it's also thank you for sharing that. Thank you, um, Daniel. Next. Yes, yeah, so you mentioned um, at the beginning of the talk that uh, uh, the resource manager um, was such a bottleneck that um, the tasking system sometimes could go down as low as uh, only being able to handle two tasks per, or dispatch uh, two tasks per second. Um, I was wondering uh, if you could uh, talk about like some of the new, the uh, performance numbers of the new um, Tasking system. Um, sure. I don't have the numbers from top of my head, but um, at least it scales with the number of workers you add because the um, the crowd algorithm kind of identifies in parallel what tasks to work on. Um, I know that I've made uh, some tests on a single VM with up to 32 workers. And at that point, you I realized, OK, now the load on the database, hitting the tasks table to find new tasks is so much that it starts to slow down again. But up until 16 workers, there was just nothing to see. And thank you, Brian. You just shared a link to the um, uh, diagrams I made from 
the numbers I got. Exactly, and there, there's a, a blog post on our website talking exactly about those speed ups. Does that answer your question? At least indirectly. Yes. Thank you. Um, Grant? Uh, yeah, just another uh, data point in terms of old tasking system. Uh, one of our downstreams, Rui, similar to what Douglas is talking about, um, syncs 600 to 1,200 repositories all at once, at least once a day. And they would see this the hang that we're talking about here, like Douglas, two, three, four times um, in in a given sync context. Um, it's another another uh, set of issues that we only have when we're performing at that level are some of the deadlock problems that we hadn't solved over the last year, which again, you would only see if you were doing hundreds of simultaneous syncs. And then that that makes these small timing windows suddenly happen. So that's the level, Mike, of, um, of not level. It gives you an idea of the size of the windows we're talking about. The windows are very small, so you have to have a lot going on to accidentally trip into them. Um, and I'm not sure that's something that we can reliably reproduce in a development environment on a regular basis, but it's certainly something that we're, we're working with some other groups here at Red Hat to be able to do performance you know, re and, and scaling problem issues where they can hammer a pulp instance with just hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, simultaneous stuff happening. And we'll learn a lot from that. Yes, that well, makes sense. At least at some point, I was able to put a sleep statement in the right place and just about the right place to, uh, to reproduce such a uh, hang. But uh, you know they're there. Of, it was one only one of the many types of hangs we get there. So uh, next, Brian, please. Um, yeah, Matthias, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about this tool that you had made, which I think is really great, um, the Hermeneg testing tool, which I put a link in the repo or into the um, chat here. Um, there's a small um, plugin, pulp plugin, Brian is referring to. And it is living in my personal uh, GitHub account. It's called Pulp Ermini, which is a small plugin with uh, an endpoint that can trigger a lot of tasks. And you can kind of uh, specify, I want a 1,000 tasks. I want about a third of them failing, and I want them to use uh, random two out of ten resources and that stuff. And we used a lot. Uh, we use this a lot to test the new tasking system for yeah the, the features of the new tasking system. And we also tried to reproduce the task hanging problems with this tool. And yeah, at some point maybe. Uh, I'm going to write tests using such a tool so that we can have proper uh, stress test of the tasking system in our CI. I just didn't get it to it yet. Um, anything to add there, Brian? No, it's a great tool. It was very useful. Um, yeah, this one is specific for the tasking system, but I can ex uh, I can imagine us to have such a debug plugin for testing in a wider range. But maybe that's for another talk. Um, Grant again. So I'm just following down. Um... The question that Mike asked triggered something for me, which is uh, multiple nodes of pulp. This tasking architecture will work just fine, even if you've got you know you've got pulp. As long as we're all sharing, obviously the same the same uh, database instance, it'll work in a multi-node environment, a clustered environment. Correct. That's correct, because Postgres is really the only communication 
point for all tasking related stuff here. Now, if we do that, we still will hit the problem that you were hitting, which is at that point, the bottleneck becomes too many things are, are hitting Postgres at the same time. So there's still a, a consideration to make there. So, there, so clustering to take advantage of this would not be just clustering pulp. It would also be thinking about what's the high availability clustering story of Postgres itself in order to make it not the bottleneck. But both of these problems sound like they could be solved or have been solved. It's just a question of setting up um, your environment in a way that that is aimed at higher performance. Does that make sense? We are sense? talking about cluster Postgres. Yeah. Yeah, that's a problem we don't solve for you. Oh, exactly right. right. Exactly right. But it is. It's not something that would need to be reinvented. There is an answer if we, if somebody says, "How do we make this performant?" It's not just this tasking system. This tasking system has all the blocks for being performant. Because even though the the database is going to be an issue, the database itself can be clustered as well to to help with the the um, the restriction that you ran into. If that makes Correct. sense. Cool. Um, can I just give a, a little bit of perspective on that idea, um, Matthias? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so the first kind of like when you talk about clustered software, whether it's tasking system or other areas, the first thing you want to do is make sure that you can scale and have um, more hardware resources, create more throughput. Like that's an architectural goal. Um, and I, I do feel that this definitely accomplishes that goal. Um, but as soon as you kind of like nailed that solution and architecture, the next, the, the game kind of changes and the game becomes how, um, how much throughput can you get for each piece of hardware that you add into the cluster? And this, this becomes more of like a problem of economics, really. And so our job, um, while yes, it's true that you can always add more Postgres nodes to, well, to a point to get more kind of transactional Postgres throughput, and that's gonna do better things for your pulp at scale. Um, we still do have more work to do. Um, I don't know, Matthias, if it's, something you feel like talking about or not, but um, we do have more work to do to make this tasking system cheaper to run. Um, it's already, I would say, I would put it in the, I would say cheap to very cheap category. And because you can run on a small Postgres database, say like 16 or 32 workers, that can already likely max out all your other hardware resources easily. Um, so like, I would say it's cheap to very cheap to run, but we still do have some improvements to make um, to make it maybe ultra cheap. Like if you wanted to run 64 or 128 or larger worker counts, we probably would need to make it a little bit cheaper. Um, and specifically, I think the issue is the transactional load that the algorithm puts on Postgres is expensive. And if we were a little bit trickier about some of the details in that algorithm, we might be able to do better. I mean, it may be as easy as having a lock that not all workers look for new tasks at the same time. Yeah, it's going to be like some small, simple things like that that we could put in place. But I think we haven't moved on that. And Matthias, I don't think we have any plans to move on that right now because we haven't had that as a goal. Um, because 32 workers is more than enough likely for most folks, famous last words. And um, until we need more, we're probably going to spend our time um, on other things. Douglas, how many workers do you run? Uh, a little more than that per host. Not by a huge amount, and the hosts aren't clustered, they're completely independent. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm so, assuming this is not the API workers. Yeah, the, yeah. exactly. This is the yeah. workers that do the syncing and the publishing and all that. Yeah, <clears throat> I think we won 40 or 42. 42 is the perfect answer. <laughs> it's slightly more than the number of calls we've got in the box. Well, that sounds like in the ballpark where you may see 
the database to slow down. I will keep that in mind that you're you're doing like a couple more uh, workers per than you have per cores. Yeah, that seems to make perfect sense. Also, Matthias, when you saw that slowdown at 32, uh, what was the what was Postgres running on? Was it was it the same box as Pulp? Were they competing for CPU, or was Postgres on its own? Yes, mode? yes, it was all the same VM. Okay, okay, so that's and like I the worst. Believe, that's the, go ahead. I believe around two CPUs, around two gigs of RAM. Okay, so not a big thing. Yeah, uh, maybe, it's like the worst case. Maybe scale testing on other hardware would uh, get to other numbers there, or okay. for sure would get other numbers. Yeah, part, part of the problem or part of the challenge is it's not that when you look at the Postgres usage, and Matthias, this is my understanding, so definitely to help me make sure this is accurate, but um, it's not that you know, you're know you going to see your Postgres like under a super large CPU load. Um, what I think you're going to see are that there's a whole, that there's many transactions that are waiting for exclusive access to the same table. And so it's, and this is a really challenge, this is an architectural problem because you can't just put more hardware behind it. Um, those, you know, it can only process that single thing so fast before it goes to the next and to the next and to the next. So um, the good news is that it's not like, it's overwhelming the CPU of Postgres, but the bad news is you can't just put more stuff behind it. Um, and kind of the interesting part, and I think you made this clear, Matthias, but it can be confusing. Um, the interesting part about this slowdown is that it's actually on the dispatch side. Um, it particularly uh, is slower when you're trying to create tasks, um, particularly. Yes, uh, the problem measuring it is I need to create a lot of tasks to see all the workers looking for them. But yes, because the workers are mostly looking for tasks, they have the shared table lock, and the dispatch wants to create a new task, so it needs the exclusive table lock. That's correct. And yes, I should have mentioned that the tasks table in Postgres is the central station where everything is, def uh, where all information about tasks is handled. And that speaks to Brian's, that's, an, that's one of the architectural issues. Is it's an it's right now it's that's an unavoidable architectural collision point. That's one of the low hanging fruit. Maybe we could look at is if if we're looking at performances, how do we ameliorate that particular collision? Not as you say, not not adding hardware, but how do we ameliorate that collision from an architectural point of view, which slowly so leads us down of, the path to lockless. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh, roughly like uh, how can we throttle the workers just about enough to get less transactions on the database. Yeah, and, and I also want to kind of accurately set the concern level, which my concern level is pretty low, actually. Um, if you look at this this blog post that Matthias put together um, for this A New Tale blog post, if you look at the top graph in the benefits and performance section, this is you can see the problem right here in this graph. Um, the, it's the dispatch time, so this is the time to create tasks. And you'll see that the new tasking system, the screen line rises, and it's on a logarithmic scale. Um, so it's rising exponentially, even though, well, it's, it's, a, it's a, a regression line that you see there. But anyways, it's, it definitely rises between 16 and 32 workers. But to be clear, right, it's, it's always between 0 0.01 and 0 0.1. So what that means is like, Okay, so if you're dispatching lots and lots and lots of tasks, each task taking one tenth of a second is is the limit. And we could further analyze that, but it would, I mean, uh, is it worth it? That's kind of the question we I kept coming back to. But to be clear, this was uh, didn't Matthias? Didn't you say this was uh, two CPUs and and a couple gigabytes of RAM? Or no? Or no? Right. This was all the uh, development VM I ran the tests on. So. Yeah. 
at least the tasking systems should be comparable because it was the same machine. Yeah, so in some sense, this, um, you know, the slowdown at 32 tasks might not even be real if there was 32 CPUs that they didn't have to fight over. Well, I guess this is what I'm trying to point out is that it's not more CPU won't make it go faster because it requires an exclusive write access to the table. And so even on a bigger Postgres, I expect to see the similar throughput. Yeah. I feel like if you have more CPUs, you're bound to put even more stress on the Postgres. Um, well, the Postgres is also running on the same box with two CPUs. So it's everything is fighting for CPUs from everything else. So even if even if it's dependent on uh, you know write locks, um, just the lack of resources could. Yeah, that's fair. That 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 there there will be some speed up. One advantage to running these kinds of tests on that kind of system is. A development VM where everything's on one node and it's resource constrained is the worst possible case, which means it will show you problems way earlier. Because this is showing us something that that's an issue. It's just we can you can see it right away. If you had a more a more production level uh, setup, you might not notice that there was an issue until you have someone who you know like Douglas is talking about. Well, I want to run two. I need to do two thousand at once. And all of a sudden you have a problem. So this is I'm a I'm actually a huge fan of what do we learn from a constrained environment because the architecture problems we're hitting are exist and we just get to see them earlier and possibly deal with them earlier uh, than if we waited until we we had a full performance run from the performance team on a more reasonable uh, setup. Um, great great numbers though. Even with the problems we're talking about here, this is such an improvement. Yes, agreed. Seeing these charts makes me want to do performance testing on a regular basis. And I know we've discussed this many times before, but it would be nice if we could have graphs like this that we generate on a regular basis with some sort of automation on dedicated hardware. Yeah, I completely agree. I think we should have a dog food server, a dog food pulp server that's somewhat approximating what someone would use in production and approximating production workload. I could easily give you uh, ideas of what a production workload is going to look like for, for pulp. <laughs> I would like to see... Uh just in response, Neil, to you and to Douglas's comment, I'd like to see a thread in discourse with exactly that, because I think that would be incredibly useful for those of it's really easy when you're developing this stuff to get used to thinking that, well, what happens on my dev box is what happens in the real world, even though we all know that's wrong. I would love to see that kind of information somewhere. Yeah, so I'm, we're, we're starting to work on a, um, a plan to implement pulp at my workplace to replace our litany of homegrown weird stuff. Um, and I can at least give you an idea of like what our setup is like with our litany weird thing. And we can talk about translating that into something useful um, to simulate with a pulp workload. Like I can at least say that the vast majority of the content is like public stuff. And, and the stuff that is non-public, I can give reasonable approximations and substitutes to to uh, uh, to to get to that kind of uh, setup. So like we have a lot of distro mirrors, we have a few we have a a few um, product internal product specific repos that we have a small set of packages in there, but we have workflows around them that for snapshots and mirrors and maintaining multiple versions and and all that kind of stuff um, and automation requirements. So I could write up something on the on the discourse forum, and we can talk about how that implementation would look like, um, so that uh, we can have something stood up 
public that kind of does something like it so that everyone can hit it and see how that looks. That would be outstanding. I would I would owe you multiple beers for that if we're ever in the same place. That sounds awesome. I'll relay the beer. Yeah, I definitely would value that. I mean, not only in terms of um, helping to improve the software itself and also maybe perhaps your outcomes, but for people to see that there are um, pulp installations of this size and to hear kind of firsthand about how those experiences have gone, I think would be very valuable to the community. Because right now, if somebody says, hey, I need a large installation, can it, can it go that far? We don't really have much in the way of kind of firsthand evidentiary um, based well, you have all those satellite installs that have pulp, right? Like those must be huge. We have a bunch of smaller installs, I would say. Um, really? Yeah, I mean, so they all run on one box. I think, like, how many workers are on these? For example, even just in the upstream with Catello, um, maybe Justin can tell us how many workers are on these boxes. Yeah, it's like number of CPUs by default. Obviously, a user can change that. Um, I know with pulp two, we saw some issues once you got above a certain number of workers. So we like capped it at like 16 or something like that. Maybe it was 24, 32. Uh, but that's that's about the, the size you're gonna get as far as number of workers. That's pretty big then, that's bigger than that. I thought it was maybe like eight or 16. So that's, pretty, that's actually pretty big, 32. I just wanted to also connect this idea with, I think Daniel's talk. I don't know when it is on the schedule, but Daniel's gonna show how some like monitoring um, tools with like Grafana, um, which I think fits hand in glove with this conversation because in tuning your system to your workload, you really want to watch your hardware metrics. Um, you could easily overwhelm other hardware resources by running too many concurrent tasks. And I think Douglas is going to be talking to us about his, his real life experiences as well. Um, the other thing about, about satellite is satellite tends to be more distributed. You have a central, but there's also a lot of capsules that are running largely independently from the main one. So it's not quite as much of a single hit, even if, you're, even if your satellite installation is supporting 100,000 clients, that's not one node. That's a lot of capsules and probably multiple satellites behind a, you know multiple dis distributed uh, clusters. Plus, at least in terms of Polk 3, we don't have that background knowledge yet, just yet. And of course, we have a, a whole lot of you know, Polk 2 based satellites that we know about, but we've not quite got there yet with uh, Polk 3. Soon. Okay, we are almost at, at time. So we have six minutes left. If there are any more questions to this topic. And if not, I don't think it hurts to finish a little bit early. And thank you very much again for listening and for discussing all of this. And it's really, I mean, I've been the main architect of the new system, and it's nice to hear that you have questions about it and that you like it. Thank you. As the SRE, this has been invaluable. Thank you, Matthias. So I will just stop the recording now.